welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Trussell. Uh, I'm the class of 1990 at Bowdoin College. I graduated with a degree in biology and environmental studies and was one class short of a minor in East Asian philosophy and religion. So I'm a good example of what a traditional liberal arts education uh, will do for you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today with Ted Ames, who received an honorary degree from Bowdoin in 2020. But of course, 2020 was a year that really disrupted so much of what we all typically do. Um, and so we're now trying to engage with our honorees. Um, and so even though we're doing it through the Zoom format, um, I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you and to, and to hear more about your life. Um, Ted uh, has a really incredibly rich history, <laughs> incredible uh, bounty of accomplishment. Uh, he's been a commercial fisherman, a scientific researcher, an educator, and an advocate for marine conservation and for sustainable fisheries uh, throughout the Gulf of Maine. And a lot of this passion and interest, which we'll hear more about from Ted in a moment, uh, started uh, while he was growing up in Vinyl Haven, uh, fishing for everything from lobster to sharks. Um, so we'll be hearing a lot more about that as well. I also want to highlight that Ted, uh, once he left the island and, and finished high school, he actually spent some time serving in the US Navy and also received uh, an undergraduate and master's degree in biochemistry. Um, so, you know, his time after that remained in the academic world doing some teaching at the University of Maine as well as the Mount Desert Island School. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he started getting more and more involved with fishing, um, both as an active fisherman, but also with a, a variety of different organizations committed to different issues surrounding the fishing community and the sustainab sustainability of fishing writ large. Um, too many things to list here, obviously, but uh, among them, serving as executive director of the Maine Gill Members Association, a uh, member of the National Marine Fisheries Advisory Committee, uh, and director of the Stonington Fisheries Alliance, just to name a few. I mean, a lot of different roles that Ted has had over the years. Um, and so what we're going to do today is spend some time hearing Ted's story, learning about what cultivated Ted's passion for fishing, and how that passion has evolved over time uh, from a way of life to also a way of action in terms of how we are gonna promote sustainable fisheries, um, hopefully going forward in the future. Uh, so Ted, great to be with you. And yeah. by the way, Ted and I have already spoken for an hour and a half, so I wish we had recorded that talk. <laughs> 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 but in any case, um, if you wouldn't mind, Ted, maybe we could start out with your, how your passion for fishing grew and, 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 and how it evolved and what that meant to when you eventually came ashore. Um, yeah, well, uh, I did grow up in Vinyl Haven and partly because it's an island surrounded by fish and shellfish and partly because uh, I, I'm from a fishing family on both sides that uh, I naturally ended up uh, getting involved. I started fishing young and uh, loved it. I still do. It's uh, some say uh, fishing isn't a business, it's a disease. <laughs> Once afflicted, you never recover. <laughs> well, uh, after growing up, uh, uh, my family kept pushing me to go to college, and uh, eventually I did, and uh, went through and got my uh, master's, and uh, after a few years, went back fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, I thoroughly enjoyed teaching. Uh, my subject area of biochemistry was fascinating. Uh, but my passion, my love, was being on the water mm -hmm. and sorting out how this fantastically complex system was working. Mm -hmm. uh, I chased one species after another, trying to figure out how, why, and where, just like every other commercial fisherman. And uh, uh, I did that for quite a while. Eventually, my body wore out and the number of fish that was left to try to catch mm -hmm. in the Gulf of Maine 
was getting pretty thin as well. Mm -hmm. So I came ashore. Um, after that, I got involved with fisheries management issues and uh, uh, then got entangled in uh, a whole suite of fisheries related issues. Uh, one major one was that uh, cod populations in the Gulf of Maine collapsed. Mm -hmm. So we that tried. Was in, the, uh, in the early 90s, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, we tried to figure out well, what could possibly be done to resurrect the stock? Uh, one good idea that we floated around and, and lobbied for was to, uh, if Maine's aquaculturists could raise juvenile cod and release them mm -hmm. in areas where uh, historical spawning grounds mm -hmm. were in nursery habitats was available, maybe we could jumpstart the cod fishery uh, back into production again. And uh, what was the initial reaction to that idea? That's pretty neat. That's not a bad idea. Right. We should, right. uh, but the catch, uh, where are these places? The right. only places known to the scientific community was a large spawning area in Ipswich Bay and another one in uh, Jeffrey's Ledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's about 200 square miles. Uh, and those sites still have spawning activity going on. Mm -hmm. And our community of fishermen along the main coast said, oh, wait a minute, we've got, you know, not only have we seen occasional places where there are ripe cod, but our fathers and grandfathers made a living off it. Mm -hmm. and." Uh, those spawning grounds were there. And we said, well, um, maybe, uh, maybe it would be a good idea if uh, you could, uh, if you could ask them about where those were, and then we would have a place to release these single end cod right. that the salmon industry is going to grow for us. <laughs> so, uh, Island Institute, God bless them, uh, found money to fund the search for uh, old goat fishermen who were former highliners for cod and haddock for a fish along the coast. That's back uh, 1950s and earlier. Right, so you wanted to find the fishermen that historically had fished these other areas. Except we did it the easy way. Um, our netters association had um, dozens of fishermen uh, north of Penobscot Bay area, and Maine Fishermen's Cooperative had dozens of fishermen south. So uh, we got together and uh, proposed that we ask our membership if they will identify individuals in their hometown where they're fishing from. Which I can who see. was the very best cod and haddock fisherman back in the days when there were lots of fish on the shore. Right. And uh, God bless them, we came back with 30 names. And Island Institute raised funds for it, mm -hmm. found funds to do so. Excuse me, to do so. Uh, and with a, a grad student from the University of Maine, I went out and we started recording these conversations. I believe with 28 out of the 30, right? 28 out of 30 agreed to do it. Yeah. Who yeah. would not? It's a time honored tradition never to tell your mouth. <laughs> um, and Except for the 28 that did. Well, <laughs> thank heaven. Because they also knew that there were no fish left there. So right, so they're not, they're not protecting it. Yeah. Long story short, 
um, they identified a thousand square miles of hitherno unknown spawning habitat along the coast of Maine, actually from Cape Ann to Bay of Fundy. So originally it was believed to be about 200 square miles, so you're talking about a five- Oh, this is in addition to the yeah, 200 right. square miles yeah. that uh, National Marine Fisheries Service right. had identified. Right. So we were on a roll. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, and National Marine Fisheries Service came through with funds for uh, growing them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, the salmon growers in the aquaculture industry were not up to the task. And in the end, when the program finished, they released a total of 500 singleton, all in Sheepskit River, uh, instead of a broad spectrum right. um, re uh, inoculation of, of fry and, and these other places. So was it just a, a high mortality? They just didn't have the expertise to raise the fish properly? or They didn't have the expertise. Right. Uh, salmon are not caught. Right. Um, and well, that was the way it was. But life goes on. And right. after that, we, um, we continued working on, on projects. Um, I, uh, at the end of all of this, I realized uh, what we really had with those historical spawning grounds for cod and haddock is we had the points of origin mm -hmm. of where every cod population in the Gulf of Maine between Cape Ann and, and, uh, and uh, Dramanan Channel mm -hmm. uh, started at. All I had to do was figure out where the cod went for the rest of the year, and we'd have the population structure of the whole Gulf of Maine. Which is not an easy thing to do, <laughs> right? Piece of cake. <laughs> um, because we were looking at fish that no longer are there, it meant that you had to go to the historical literature right. to find out where it was going. And of course, Captain Good and his cohort did this enormous study back in the 1880s uh, that was revisited in the late 1920s by an a old fellow by the name of Walter Rich, mm -hmm. who documented every fishing ground in the Gulf of Maine that, uh, that he could get fishermen to share with. Mm -hmm. And he would gather groups of fishermen together and asking questions about where was this, that, or the other uh, ground, and what, and they came up with hundreds mm -hmm. of small, scattered fishing grounds that had been well known by the fleet, uh, documented when these species, cod or haddock and hake and mm -hmm. the commercial species of the day were located, what seasons they were there, I said, there's the gold mine right there mm -hmm. to sort it. So I, I, uh, I developed this protocol. I said, well, uh, let's approach it like a fisherman would and track abundances of fish right. through the year. So first of all, we'll use the fishing grounds as, a, as an XY plot, mm -hmm. uh, points in an XY plot. We'll use uh, the amount of fish that are there according. We'll make a relative index, mm -hmm. abundance index, from Rich's description of how many fish were on that ground mm -hmm. for that particular season. So if there's none, the fishing ground is blank. If there's one, then we'll have a light shade of mm -hmm. some color. Mm -hmm. And when the, the greatest fishing ground in the area, it's worth a four. Right. And the in-betweens, we're in between. So uh, you're able to do this for each location through time? Yeah, uh, uh, for uh, uh, through the course of the year. Yeah. So you'll get a different display for every 
uh, every every quarter. Right. Um, and it worked great. And uh, displaying that on our GIS, uh, you could see uh, where the historical spawning grounds were located, the fishing grounds that were uh, uh, from rich were overlaid, and the color. Well, coincidentally, I chose the concentration of fish closest to spawning grounds uh, that had uh, a large population of fish. Mm -hmm. It was a dark colored one. Right. And then I flipped it to the next season and drew a line to its nearest neighbor concentration of mm -hmm. fish, doing this for all the fish along the coast, mm -hmm. and followed this procedure through the course of the year. Um, interestingly enough, when I went back, uh, when the spring rolled around, these fish were going back to the same place. Right. So they're very fellow Patrick. They were very, they had high site fidelity. There was site yeah. fidelity. Yeah. And more than that, uh, when you took the aggregate of, of uh, circular patterns, uh, there were four different units that uh, appeared to be discrete mm -hmm. between Cape Ann and Bay of Fundy mm -hmm. uh, that had these circular movement patterns. Uh, they had a different fall, spring migration corridor mm -hmm. for each one of them. And uh, on top of that, when you analyze the landings that are reported to coming from those areas, they were different. Mm -hmm. they, they, uh, so I used that information and said, this is, uh, these are subunits. Right of the larger Gulf of Maine population, right. subpopulations of cod, and... Uh, that behave very independently. So I think the message, importantly, is that it's not just one big population in the Gulf of Maine. There are these discrete subpopulations that are doing un things unique to them. That exactly. Yeah. Which means, and they didn't recover. The cod in Penobscot Bay, for example, never come back. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it did down east uh, as across the Panty Way. Uh, the point was, if these spawning groups didn't come back, it meant that we were dealing with an ecological component. This isn't counting the number of fish that go in and go out. Yeah. We were dealing with an ecological subunit that was a component within the larger Gulf of Maine uh, uh, population. Uh, and it wasn't just for codfish. It meant that it had to include those biological communities that allowed cod or attracted right. cod to become members within that component. Mm -hmm. uh, this, was, this was a serious move because it meant that the traditional production model used by National Marine Fisheries Service right. stunk. Right. The, the, the traditional production model was inadequate, and the surveying methods, which are used to this day, are inadequate. I mean, do you want to elaborate on that a little <laughs> bit more? Because I think it's important for people to realize the significance of, of this work that you've done and what it means to how we look at fisheries and how we manage them. Um, before we get into it, I have to tell you a, a little story about th their surveys. They're wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. And what I did when they started publishing these fishermen surveys, they take extracts of various commercial species and send them around to commercial mm -hmm. fishermen. Well, I collected them for several years and plotted out the locations of fish where I had and mm -hmm. plotted out where this body of fish was going to be each year, because each year they would call random stratified sampling. There was only so much strata of a particular type in an area, which meant that there's a redundancy there. Mm -hmm. So it made it very good fishing for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for others. Yeah. And for others, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. No, I never mentioned it to anybody. They would have had to have figured it out themselves. 
Well, that's I'm sure they did. <laughs> no, right, right. Well, I mean, that's one of the big challenges, though, right, is that um, you have fishermen that have this knowledge, and that knowledge can be incredibly informative to how the fishery is managed, right? Yeah. Um, but as you and I were chatting outside, you know, the term decimated, hammered, you know, that knowledge can also be very hurtful. Yeah. Well, the, the most notable thing is the, the, the connection bet the, the model for managing ground fish by National Marine Fisheries Service in the past, single species, mm -hmm. monitoring, et cetera, mm -hmm. it's not an ecological right. analysis. Mm -hmm. It's this number of fish plus or minus 25%, 30%, this number of fishermen, and we can cut the, the cloth in this many pieces. This is how many fish you guys can catch this year, guys. Right. Uh, nothing to do with juvenile uh, survival rates or, or uh, species interactions, right. et cetera, Food et cetera. supplies, yeah. yeah. And fishermen who say, you're not sampling the fish. There's all kinds of fish over here. Why are you going uh, half a Out mile the over there? Yeah. Right. And uh, the reality is, is, is the two groups have been talking apples and oranges forever. Fishermen are talking ecological information. Mm -hmm. The fish are here. They're here because the substrate is right, because their feed there or because they are pre-spawning aggregations or the temperature is not right over mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but et cetera. And that was dismissed for 45, 50 years by this current method, which was supposed to make things really simple. Right. It didn't. But it's because the, the basic concept of the production model was flawed. Mm -hmm. The idea was that if you, uh, that, let's use cod because that's, that's everybody's one. sacred cow. Right. Uh, cow of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> or whale. Oh, uh, less the manatee. <laughs> um, cod are supposed to be a pandemic. That means uh, if you have a whole room full of chairs filled with cod and a bunch of them disappear from in that, the cod will redistribute themselves. Mm -hmm. What that, that study right. showed was right. they did not. Right. Uh, they also uh, 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 said, well, in the process of this shift, they'll reproduce any more fish. Mm -hmm. What we found was that cod re returned to nasal spawning bed. So that high site fidelity. Uh, significant fidelity. I, I, you know, there's no absolute even percent. Sure. Uh, but, and you go on. It's supposed to make life simple for the fishermen because it's so straightforward. Mm -hmm. In reality, it's created a morass of complicated regulations. That uh, have significant economic impact. Well, it's a significant ecological impact. And it's, it's, it's tough for a working fisherman Absolutely. to accommodate to them. But the other part is, is that this is supposed to allow uh, one to uh, predict. Right. Well, next year, boys, you're going to have a great crop. Right. It never happened. Uh, it's... Uh, so you and I are sitting here beneath the pines, and you know this, and I know this, and I mean, you have way more experience in this than I do, but obviously I, we've discussed, I've spent some time with folks down in Massachusetts very much concerned about similar issues. And you may not want to answer this question, and it's okay if you don't. <laughs> but but why, aren't we, why aren't we moving the needle? I mean, you know, why, you know, why are the regulatory agencies not appreciating the need to, to change how they go about doing stock assessments? It's tough uh, for a suite of reasons. Uh, one of them, if, 
if if they ain't confessed that uh, they've been doing it wrong for 40, 50 years, they will let be so many lawsuits that uh, every fisherman on the coast may end up retiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Wealthy. <laughs> uh, but uh, in reality, National Marine Fisheries Service is trying hard, mm -hmm. uh, but trying to uh, divorce this linkage to single species right. of uh, management that everybody in the commercial fleet has adjusted to uh, is really difficult. But uh, I have to mention that um, the main Center for Coastal Studies mm -hmm. down in Stonington that we started uh, a number of years ago uh, in conjunction with the National Marine Fisheries Service is trying to use the eastern main area as mm -hmm. uh, a, a, uh, a, an area that uh, we can perhaps evolve or adapt to get. To do that more local based management. Exactly. Yeah, much like the lobsters, or yeah. analogous to what's done with the lobster fishery. It is, yeah. it's close. Um, but for uh, species like cod, um, you need a larger right. subunit. Mm -hmm. Ideally, if this it can be pursued long enough and far enough, one can create a management structure for fishermen who can operate within the mm -hmm. uh, subunits uh, that include not only cod, but haddock and Mm -hmm. uh, Pollock are more uh, pelagic than mm -hmm. the other gad is, but there's a whole suite of species that are concentrated uh, in the subunits, forage species as well as right. as uh, uh, predators that uh, function as a unit. Right. And I think this may be the way to get to it, but it's not going to be accomplished quickly. We've got a lot of moving pieces in this sure. situation. Sure. Yeah, I mean, well, it, you know, Maine folks tend to be grassroots and tend to be able to figure this stuff out. Uh, you know, for places like Massachusetts, as I alluded to earlier, th there's been this, historically, this massive distrust between the regulator and the fishery. And so, you know, I wonder if you have any advice that I can take back to Massachusetts about how we, we deal with that trust because, I mean, there's multiple layers to the complexity of this problem for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, obviously, you know, the first step in my mind with any endeavor involving humans, sorry for human references, is um, how do we build that trust that allows the conversations to take place that would allow actions like what you're describing to actually occur? Uh, you have uh, two different things here. You have federal management and state. Mm -hmm. uh, in Maine, state management and fisheries uh, for significant changes in how management is conducted, it has to go through the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, and when that happens uh, and the issue is important, you get a thousand fishermen piling up into the public meeting and intimidate anyone who's going in a different direction because there's a, a large voting population. Sure. In Massachusetts and New Hampshire and most other places, these decisions are made by the department. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, they don't have an ace in the hole. Mm -hmm. But personally, I think I think uh, Massachusetts uh, Department of Fisheries is is a pretty receptive, responsible outfit. Yeah, no, I think they're great. It's it's it's, it's more the feds that I think yeah. are the issue, right? I mean, yeah, and and that's a killer. Um, uh, ITQs were not a good choice. Will you tell everybody what ITQs are? Oh, I'm are? sorry. It's okay. Um, along with the Magnuson Act, along with the 200-mile limit, 
there was this uh, tendency to uh, adapt this single species production model management system. Well, accompanying it, if you're going to take the trouble to count all of the fish, then you need to be sure you've got a control on how many fish are actually being caught. And the preferred way, mm -hmm. both in Europe and here, has been to create quota. Right. Uh, in our case, individual transferable quota okay. uh, that attach to the vessel. Not the individual, but to the vessel. Right. Uh, that means that uh, if you own the boat, you receive the quota. Uh, you hire Joe Blow to go fishing for you, and you tell him, you fill that boat, and you got a job forever, and you come in with an empty hold, you're fired. So go do your thing. Right. And he goes out and gets caught doing something he shouldn't. Meet the quota. He pays. Not the boat, not the owner. Right. That's a problem. So stewardship automatically becomes a problem with ITQ. Mm -hmm. If he catches a lot of fish that he shouldn't have or he doesn't have quota for, mm -hmm. he can go around the fleet and buy or, lend or, or rent lease the uh, quota from other boats or other, other quota owners. Right, so if he's doing really well and he's always exceeding his quota, he can buy more quota from other boats. So it yeah. creates this second market, but in the same process, it eliminates the need for stewardship. Mm -hmm. It becomes, he's on that. We'll fill the boat. We'll get some quota. We only get half as much uh, for the top of our catch because we have to pay the fellow who's renting it to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. But it's still more money. And so that's what happens. Contrast that with Maine's owner-operator rule that governs all its coastal fishery. Right. Uh, lobster, lobster fishery yeah. is uh, two-year apprentice plan. Uh, captain's rod of the license holder mm -hmm. has to be aboard the boat. He's responsible for everything that happens there. And if his boat is caught in violation, uh, may it be uh, lobsters that are too small or halibut that's too small or big or whatever, he goes to court for it. Right. His stern man may have done it, but, but he's, on the boat. he's the skipper and he's right. on the boat. Yeah. Um, so that accountability is key to stewardship. Well, that's an important part yeah. because if he does things that improves the number of lobsters in the water or returns juvenile halibut so that they will grow, he has a chance to make more money. Mm -hmm. Absolute, because he already has his boat and his gear and his stern man and whatever. And this is just like putting money in the bank. Right. Uh, I'll bet you're competing with your fellow fishermen. They're playing by the same rules. Uh, yeah, I call it fisherman stewardship. Right. Uh, if you're a better fisherman, you'll get a bigger cut. But if you don't take care of it, nobody. Exactly. And that's Very part smart. of what's happening out so offshore. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, uh, you know, I like smaller boats anyway, even though the bigger boats are incredibly good. They're really efficient. And unless they have enormous areas to operate in, yeah. um, I um, wanted you to talk about that a little bit. Sorry to interrupt, because you, what, well, you, what you described to me in terms of how fishing was done 30 years ago versus how it's done now, the technology. <laughs> <laughs> you think the technology is good today. It is tenfold better than it was back in the mid-late 50s post-World War II and a decade and a half. Things like uh, sonar. Um, 1957, my father was skipper of the uh, surge uh, 
140 foot vessel that is targeting redfish mm -hmm. on the Grand Banks. Uh, oh, no, I don't know, but they were still operating in Georgia or will longer change. Average a million pounds of redfish per month for 20, 12 months in a row belong to what they call the uh, million pound a month mm -hmm. club, mm -hmm. which is the 40 fathom seafood plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to average fishing a year uh, in, or four months out of the year sometimes, uh, about 500,000 pounds right. going every day. So one year versus one month or two months, I should say. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, there used to be redfish aplenty in the Gulf of Maine, too, mm -hmm. but they cleaned those out prior to that. Post-World War II, they finished cleaning out redfish in the Gulf of Maine, and that's why these boats were ending up fishing the Canadian banks. They mm -hmm. cleaned Jordan and, and just followed the chain of banks along. They're wonderful boats. Uh, the but they're maybe too good. <laughs> the farther offshore you go, the bigger the boats are, the better the skippers are, the better the electronics and mm -hmm. equipment are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, these are incredible devices. Uh, typical midwater trawler uh, for herring, if you can't get a million pounds a day, uh, something's wrong. Right. Uh, uh, the pair trawling. Sure. I mean, what you're describing, though, is it, the fish don't stand a chance. Boy, have you got it right. Uh, and and the, the skippers that are using this equipment are superb. They're really good at what they do. Yeah. And uh, Vito is no exception. These guys are good. You're talking about my Vito? I'm talking about your Vito. Okay. <laughs> I'll be happy to hear that. Well, you can say <laughs> hi. You can say hi I for me it. too. <laughs> but will. but the problem is the same thing that happened to those boats. They mm -hmm. all ended up in the graveyard because there was no fish there. And yeah. redfish, they don't mature until they're 13. Yeah, and I think people, you know, people don't realize, and this is what we're learning a lot with the Gloucester community, is that it's the challenges with you know having a sustainable harvest. It's not just an e economic consequences. It's also having significant mental health consequences. For you know, our, John Grabowski, who we, we talked about earlier, he's been doing a study. Yeah. I mean, they're seeing lots of signals that are very are very similar to PTSD yeah. in terms of what the fishers are experiencing well, in that community. It's incredible stress. Yeah. Uh, if you if you're fishing George's banks, uh, and, and that's anyway. where those guys are at. Yeah. If you go out there in anything less than about an 80-footer, you're out of your mind because uh, you can get into a mess fast. Sink, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's a catch. Uh, once you're up the tree, once you find that your elephant in the backyard garden <laughs> uh, not and there isn't eat. enough to eat. Right. What are you going to do? Right. You've got your life's work invested in that boat. And you've got a family to feed. You've got a family to feed. Mm -hmm. uh, the boat is expensive sitting at the dock as it is trying to catch a fish. Yep. What are you going to do? Yeah. And um, I thought maybe the feds had tumbled on something when they said we're going to have a buyout of uh, boats. Mm -hmm. uh, of the 48 boats that were in the Gilnet fleet back at that time, uh, they bought out maybe a third of them, and another third uh, sold their permits because you're only fishing four months, right. three or four months a year. Right. You don't have 
the quota to make a living at it. And the others just went on a business too. Right. Uh, Maine was fortunate because uh, our, our coastal states traditionally switched between a suite of systems. Right. You know, lobstering yep. or baining or, or <laughs> scalloping, yeah. uh, ground fishing, yeah. crimping and scalloping in the winter. Uh, right. Those have gradually been chipped away. Uh, we uh, we now have one fishery, and that's lobster. Right. But it is the best managed fishery, I swear, in the country. Right. Uh, I mean, would you call it a fishery or a fish farm on a grand scale? Uh, no question. It's uh, the world's largest chicken farm with lobsters <laughs> in it. It's uh, it's it's fabulous because. Several thousand full-time fishermen making a living uh, off this one species have agreed to sort and are doing yeah, that's returning the juveniles, nice. returning gravid females, uh, notching them, yep. uh, returning oversized male lobsters mm -hmm. so the females they've thrown over can uh, find a mate yeah. and feed them, provide shelter for them every day. Yeah, that's <laughs> what the, more could that's you the do? Big one. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I realize that we only have about 15 minutes left. And so one thing I do is remind our audience that they should submit questions if they have questions for you, because their questions will probably be better than mine. Um, but also, I don't know if the people that organize this event realize that today is World Oceans Day. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so you know, it would be good for you and I to spend a little bit of time just talking about the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead, right? Because you've wonderfully highlighted just how the ecological slash biological complexity of the cod fishery, for example, with all of its distributed subunits and high site fidelity, um, how that can create a, a particularly vexing challenge with respect to management, right? Yeah. Um, but then, of course, overlaying on that, on that complexity are other large-scale phenomena that we're dealing with, the warming of the Gulf of Maine, um, the range expansion with different species, although, as, as you pointed out earlier, maybe those interpretations aren't accurate. Um, and, and, and then finally, just, you know, the, the, this idea of what I call watershed or land-sea connection, you know, that a lot of times what's happening on land is very important in terms of its influence on fisheries, and I'm not, we're not talking just about these nearshore fisheries, but we're talking about offshore fisheries. So if you looked at those three things, um, climate change, uh, watershed connections, and forgive me, I forgot the third one. What are our prospects for the future? Are we, are we feeling good? Are we, are we still figuring it out, or? Um. Uh, I, I think both are right. I think we're doing okay. Um, we have no choice. What we see is what we got. Um, climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the variables uh, that, I, that I see are, uh, number one, it isn't happening as fast as one would expect. Uh, black sea bass, boy, they're delicious. They are, um, especially raw. <laughs> well, I, I... That's a little bit of being, trouble. Being well. from down east Maine, I have a lot of experience <laughs> with that, but I'll take your word on it. No, I trust me. <laughs> off of Martha's Vineyard, they're, they're quite good. Um, they, uh, they occasionally have been caught farther north for mm -hmm. uh, decades. But it's a slow process for a species to shift far, far enough for us to actually observe it. And uh, if I was just sitting and saying, well, if a population is going to increase northward, it would do it gradually by jumping over uh, Cape Cod and 
Mass mm -hmm. Bay mm -hmm. would be the first place, and then maybe Casco Bay would be the next. Right. And you'd have stepping stone leaders that were showing up earlier. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think Rich mentioned um, that there were uh, Black Sea bass reported in the early 1900s uh, north of Metinicus. That's remarkable. Um, but, and, and uh, my brother and I had caught a few up in the upper part of Penobscot mm -hmm. Bay on the east side a number of years ago, but yeah. um, we had a cold winter that year, and that was the end of it. And that beat them back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, apparently. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, these, these systems are, are fluid, and mm -hmm. uh, the transition zone that we think, well, it ought to be just north or south of the Cape, or north or south of, of Portland, when it actually may occupy uh, a couple of hundred miles of coastline that's right. going to have this transition occurring. Right, it's not necessarily this very demarcated boundary. Yeah, yeah. and the other part is, is, uh, is the niche that they fill available? Right. What's competing for the same thing? Yeah. And we've got a lot of holes in our uh, biological community. Uh, so they right could experience now. some ecological release coming in and filling, yeah. 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 Now we actually have some questions from the audience, which is exciting. Oh, great. Yeah, the, the virtual audience, not, not oh. the people sitting oh. here. <laughs> Um, the first one is, uh, is the lobster, and we have about 13 minutes left, so I, I, do we have a fair number of questions come in? Because that would be great to spend some time on those. Um, is the lobster management in Maine equal to the salmon fisheries management in Alaska? Uh, it's different. Uh, the salmon farm and uh, the salmon uh, fishery in Alaska is is just incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got, you know, just thinking that you've, you've got a salmon hatchery and you're uh, breeding fingerlings and releasing them, uh, that they travel so far and get so many back and you've got these huge vessels that are uh, midwater trawling for pollock, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or Alaskan pollock. Uh, running this gauntlet both ways, and yeah. uh, they're yeah. still getting these huge returns. That's a fabulous system. Uh, Plus the, the, the wild system, the, the wild populations are still doing well. And yeah. yeah so the, 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 the wild and the farm populations seem to be living harmoniously. Yeah, of the, yeah, we shouldn't say farm. Okay. To an Alaskan. <laughs> Okay. Salmon fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Just say hatchery. It's a good thing we're here in Maine. Hatchery. Sorry, hatchery. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, th I think they're uniquely different, but, uh, and I think this will go along fine. But there's a difference. I think, uh, I'm not sure, but salmon, I think, are tertiary consumers. They're mm -hmm. higher up the pecking mm -hmm. order mm -hmm. than lobsters, which are yes. secondary consumers. Right, which is why we shouldn't be feeding them herring, but that's another conversation. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, is, which is part of why uh, uh, a credible recovery in, in these subunits that we talked about mm -hmm. that surfaced through that study, um, we could create a situation where there simply weren't that many lobsters anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, assuming conditions were right for bringing back these species. Right. And right now it is. It may not be 20, 30, 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be interesting if you could bring back one of these subunits so that fishermen could essentially harvest a suite of species rather than a single monoculture, right. monoharvest. Right. Yeah, which is, I mean, you know, back when I was here at Bowdoin uh, yeah. from 1986 to 1990, uh, I was reading a lot of uh, 
Jay Krause's reports. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was taking Ed Gilfillan's marine ecology class. Do you remember Ed Gilfillan? I do. Yeah. And uh, we were always worried about that one disastrous cohort, you know, the one bad recruitment year cohort, to name off of, because once yeah. that happens, given the life histories, it, there's going to be a really, really bad year. It could. But, but, but it hasn't happened. No. In, uh, I mean, I hate to admit this, 30 years since I've been thinking and talking about it. Well, the ace in the hole that the lobster hatch, uh, fishery has is that uh, uh, lobsters live for nobody right. knows 70, 80 years. Right. And a Canadian study a number of years ago found that the larvae coming from large, old, mm -hmm. oversized lobsters are more viable, a better survival rate than the other guy. Yeah. And it's like, boy, you mean you can have 10 failed population uh, uh, events in a row and still have uh, a huge spawning population? Right, yeah. So they, they, they've got an ace in the hole if they leave the big ones alone. Right, which is, Maine's always been ahead of the curve on that. I mean, I, I can't remember whether or not Massachusetts has finally put a maximum size limit on or not. I mean, I remember back in the 90s, there was no max size limit. No. That was one of the big criticisms. No. Uh, there's an offshore migration of Venox lobsters that ends up down off the Cape. Is that right? <laughs> they wouldn't <laughs> pad with it. <laughs> they love that. Um, so another one we have, which gets to this connected watersheds idea, is what uh, role do river herring play in Maine fishery? Oh, my Lord. This is work that, that uh, John Lister and, mm -hmm. and I uh, have been on, uh, all were on. And what we found was uh, there's a huge predation linkage between aquatic mm -hmm. marine systems, mm -hmm. and it hinges primarily on LYs and bluebacks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you could throw shad in too. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of others that end up in that pot. Uh, that uh, they are so prolific mm -hmm. that when that system, uh, when they had access to their historic spawning ground, they were they the Casco Bay and um, this whole area around here. Penobscot Bay is another, was a soup of living right. baby fish. Right. And it attracted enormous populations of um, cod and haddock and mm -hmm. whales and you name it. Seabirds that ate mm -hmm. them were... The web of life. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and uh, to assume that uh, they never were, or that the depletion of ground fish along the coast of New England isn't related, at least in part, mm -hmm. but to the loss of those uh, uh, of those prey species. Um, I think we'd be fooling ourselves. I think it's just surfacing how important this mm -hmm. linkage between aquatic marine systems right. is. Which is why the dam removals that are taking place throughout New England, but particularly Maine, are a really good thing, right? It really is. But the things that are Massachusetts is doing in removing them works, too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it isn't uh, every river that has uh, a stopper at head of tide now. Right. I mean, Maine's got two good-sized rivers with uh, access pretty well Mm -hmm. up. And the Kennebec has been doing incredibly well. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, there's still work going on there. I hope it continues. I can't wait to see what will happen to the collapsed uh, right. um, ecological unit. It right. may not be cod that comes back in them. It may be black sea bass. <laughs> <laughs> But that, it, I don't think that market will be as lucrative. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one other
other question we have is, um, my grandfather was a politician and longtime environmental advocate. His goal was to work with fishermen, not against them. What are some of the best ways that policy can work within the livelihoods of New England fishermen? That's a, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Um, Since you're up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, policy is tricky. Um, you've got um, 10 fishermen in a room, and you ask them about a policy, and you've got 11 opinions. <laughs> Somebody changed their mind. Right. right. Um, it's, uh, there's a level of independence that mm -hmm. uh, people who fish right. uh, exhibit that you don't always run into. Uh, and uh, uh, they are generally not reluctant to stand up what they feel is best sure. for them. Yeah. So when you approach policy, uh, it seems very much to me that you need to, uh, you need to have your ducks in a row and you need to already have figured out where the fisherman is going to be coming from. Um, right. Because if you can't right. answer the question that he's going to bring up, uh, you're dead in the water before you get the next sentence out. How do you, do you think scientists can help that conversation, though? I mean, my, my personal, just my, before you, I mean, my personal experience is that there is some cynicism uh, about scientists among some fishers. Um, because the science is being viewed as what drove the implementation of policy that has often yeah. challenged the livelihoods of fishermen. That is one of the key goals that we had when we started uh, the Center for Coastal Fisheries. Uh, to give you an example, uh, we're next door to the biggest co-op, lobster co-op, mm -hmm. uh, uh, biggest fishing co-op, I think, on the East Coast. There's a sign that says something like, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service destroying fishermen's jobs, da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> so uh, along with that is uh, a group of fishermen who uh, have and continue to work closely mm -hmm. with scientists mm -hmm. and have uh, through that organization for years. Uh, we set up to say, if you have a question of what's happening out there in the bay, bring it in right. and we'll connect you with a scientist who will uh, or vice versa. take it on for a problem. Yeah or vice versa, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's happened. But along, and then we uh, evolved this, this uh, sentinel survey mm -hmm. for a fish to see what's out there. Nobody's been fishing out of Stonington, for example, for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, wow. 20 years maybe. Wow. There's not a single, fishing, ground fish fishing boat from Ca Vinyl Haven to Canada. Not a one. Is that right? They have been, it's all lost in the, the fishery has yeah. been eliminated. There's only one or two uh, federal permits for Atlantic herring left in the state. We used to have dozens of uh, uh, stop sales. Uh, same goes for scallops. Maine is basically out of federal fisheries altogether, wow. except for a few places. Yeah. Well, my, my feeling is that as a scientist, I mm -hmm. think it's the scientist's job to, to forge that relationship. Right? That's a key part of it. Yeah, um, because I think that um, the regulators and the scientists, they're, they're not the ones trying to put food on the table, gas in the car, and keep the lights on. And so it's it's... You know, it's as much of an academic exercise for them. You, you know, they're just they're they're removed from the real potential implications of 
not yeah. not making your quota or not having a boat to rent. Yeah, well, the, again, the federal fisheries create a real dilemma. Coastal fisheries are different. Um, in the lobster fishery, for example, Bob Sennett has yeah, been, Bob uh, yep. been a very vocal advocate, yep. but he's also uh, jumped in and tackled questions and issues that lobstermen had. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he's come up with answers that are Both tail in too, <laughs> but he's, he's, he's done it and he said, look, this is the way it is. This is what right. I found. Yeah, yeah. And that's the credibility that you're straight shooting. You're yes. not telling the fleet what to do. You're telling them what is there the data. and they've got to come up with a rationale that will allow them to survive under those conditions that you've uh, discovered right. in your right. research. Right. So I, I'm, I agree. I think, uh, I think science and scientists are, are uh, a great bridge uh, between the two. Yeah. Uh, uh, between uh, policy uh, and stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, policy from up top, uh, <laughs> just you know, yeah. uh, if you're if if you know of a fisherman who hasn't gone to uh, a council meeting and complained of a problem uh, or tried to take a position on a policy being discussed, it's kind of like. Uh, you're approaching the Pope, it isn't a matter of you discussing a problem that's uh, a credible solution. You're confronting an organization that is so big and so powerful. Right. Odds are 90 to 1 that uh, there isn't a single person there that has any experience relating to the situation exactly. you have. Exactly. And out of that, they're going to change a policy right. that will address your issue. So it's a step too far. Yeah. And I, I've, I've felt for a long time, and that's one of the nice parts about the, the lobster council system that we evolved in Maine. People fishing don't need uh, 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 pontificate. Structure, mm -hmm. king or right. whatever on the top. They need a governance structure, a key, yeah, a key where you yeah. where you elect the people that mm -hmm. uh, uh, can share or present your concerns. That'll go and meet with a body of other people in similar situations and come up with some sort of rational solution that uh, gets presented farther down the road. Well, we have that because of this peculiar management system that we have in Maine. Right. Uh, the Maine Lobster Zone Councils are, are uh, actually advisory councils, mm -hmm. but the advisory councils are received by the legislature by saying, uh, They'll make a bill and they say, you tell us what you think about it and we'll deal with it. Right, right. Well, that's eliminated the uh, approaching the throne syndrome. Sure. It's creating a situation where people who work for a living on the water have a voice yeah. that's heard, but it's being heard at a level that has a possibility of a good outcome. Yeah, stakeholder engagement and stakeholder driven outcomes for sure. Yeah. Well, um, we are at our hour, but um, I could talk to you for three more hours. Oh, we've had a good <laughs> show. <laughs> we, we, we have, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, not that I ever doubted it, but I can see why after listening to you, you received your Ma MacArthur Award. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really wonderful. I, and this can't be the last time that we interact. We'll have to get you down to the Coastal Sustainability Institute and have you talk with our folks down there too. Well, I would enjoy that. 
of John Grabowski is, is, uh, is a good egg. Really nice guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, I would enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, no pleasure. It's a uh, it's been a treat. Cheers. We're allowed to shake hands. They're both fully vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Ted. Oh, thank you for a great. Thanks. Talk. Thanks, everyone.